ਦੀ ਦਰਸ਼ਨ ਨਹੀਂ ਕਰਦਾ Hey everyone uh so we'll just start the session uh so first let me introduce myself i'm rohit uh, i'm co-founder and vp engineering at uh, fesis cloud uh fesis cloud is a platform engineering product basically what we offer is uh, a product where you can uh, you get a canvas you can drag drop in uh, components and uh, build a blueprint for your software architecture and using that architecture you can uh you know create and manage environments so that's a short introduction to our product you can check out our website and everything uh but today why we are here is to discuss specifically about uh, loki uh so uh to introduce the other talkers here so we have srijit so he is a devops lead at capillary technologies uh he uh, he has been at capillary technologies for like nearly a decade and he has seen through uh all sort of modernization efforts and you know loki adoption is just one amongst them and fortunately like we could work with uh, capital technologies as one of the early adopters of uh, the facets implementation of uh, loki uh, and pramod who is a lead at uh, facets uh, he uh, he joined uh, so he uh, was responsible for developing the uh, loki offering in facets and uh, we co-built it with uh, the capillary folks and srijit was very heavily involved in uh, in that and a lot of his feedback and learnings of uh, taking it to production at a large scale uh, helped us mature our offering um, uh, uh, like greatly right uh, let me just share my screen yeah so as i said so uh, sorry uh, yeah i already introduced uh, uh, the speakers here and so i'll also briefly introduce capillary technologies so capillary technologies is a customer engagement uh, leader so they are into the crm business and they serve a massive user base so if you have ever been to a retail store and you have been uh, issued a coupon or uh, or you have gotten some points from a transaction uh, it's a fairly good uh, there is a fairly good chance that you have been served by uh, capillary technologies right uh, and they empower a lot of major global brands so uh, and of course with the gdpr restrictions so they have uh, deployments and uh, deployments across the globe like uh, europe us uh, uh, southeast asia uh, india specifically right and uh, they have moreover they have a large en engineering operation of around 200 developers and uh, which is where which is why i think today's talk would be uh, more interesting in the sense that it's not just a technical problem it's also a cultural switch when you are uh, you know switching to a new logging solution altogether uh, so yeah so as i said uh, we were co-building uh, loki with uh, uh, with srijit from capital technologies and uh what we'll do today in today's session is to share some of our learnings basically we'll just reiterate uh what we went through we will not go into the technical depths right now because uh we might have people with varied experiences and uh, with loki or very very uh, exposure to loki in the audience but we are happy to take any questions so do put your questions into the chat at the end of the session we'll have a q and a session where we'll try to answer as many questions as possible uh yeah so that said i'll hand it over to srijit uh, so yeah srijit you can take over thank you rohit uh, thank you for having me let me share the screen here
I hope it's uh, visible. Yeah. Yeah. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining. Um, so my name is Srijit. Uh, I'm working as a DevOps engineer in Capillary Technologies. Uh, I have been with the company for uh, like around nine years now. And uh, all these years I have been working with the infrastructures and uh, cloud resources across technologies. And um, recently, um, in upgrading our uh, observatory platform, we decided to move our logging um, tech, uh, strategy to Loki. And uh, in this webinar, I will be explaining our uh, uh, journey experience that we had with uh, Loki. Um, so when it comes to the logging in uh, capillary, um, we have uh, customers across the globe. We have infrastructure across the globe. And uh, we have around 1.5 TB of uh, logs that is being, uh, in average, we are uh, churning out, where uh, which is required to be uh, retained for uh, logs for a year also due to compliance requirements. Um, logs often refer for um, uh, backtracking, uh, real-time investigating, real-time issues, and uh, going back to um, older pro older date when a customer reports a problem. So uh, to a certain extent, uh, these logs are used for investigation purposes. Now, the legacy mechanism that we hold here to handle the logs and uh, store it where we use a FluentD uh, collector which sends the data to all our log data to uh, EFS where we store it as a temporary storage and from there uh, we attach a, a VETI SSH terminal um, which is a web terminal VETTY it's actually an open source tool with which uh, developers or anybody can run uh, Linux commands on those uh, log files and grab uh, the strings that they want during the investigating time. And uh, later on, after three days, we will be pushing those logs to S3 bucket as an archival strategy, and we'll be keeping it there. Now, um, as time flies by, uh, number of applications increase, number of logs that are written by the applications increase due to due feature addition. Um, EFS started getting um, a bottleneck in the IOPS part, and uh, we had to increase the IOPS in time to time. And later on, we had to um, create a replica of EFS to have the reads uh, and the writes separated out in order to handle uh, the slowness or the IO. But to a certain extent, we were not able to scale up more than this. And uh, uh, as for the log volume increase, the whole system wasn't scaling up. We wanted, uh, we had to add additional manners in managing different, different uh, moving components here, creating alerts, monitoring them. Uh, that was a tedious job at some, part, at some point. Now, what is the ROA on this? Um, a fraction of these logs are used for troubleshooting. There are billions of log lines being written and uh, terabytes of data being stored. It's a large chunk uh, of data where we can have, uh, we can identify an application performance, how the uh, API calls are happening. A um, lot and lot more data will be present in those uh, log files, which we can leverage. This uh, is an architecture diagram that uh, we used to follow in our uh, legacy mechanism, where uh, we have a Fluentd pod fetching the log files from uh, different applications and sending that to EFS, on which every application pod is running, which on uh, through which the developers can run their uh, Linux commands to grab the data. Now, considering all these issues at hand, we were looking for a better solution that can solve us, uh, that can improve our dev efficiency as well as solve our problems and get more insights from uh, the log data that we have. So these were the four candidates that we picked during our evaluation, where ELK, Parsible, Loki, New Relic were the major ones. Now, considering each one of them, ELK is scalable. We used to run that in our uh, smaller cluster subsidiary application clusters. But uh, to a certain extent, what we understand is that it's a bit of, uh, expensive to operate. You need more number of nodes as the log, line, uh, log volume goes high, um, availability, space issues, and archived log retrieval was quite a problem for us. Then comes Parsible. 
which was the uh, simplest application among them, uh, which didn't have an HA, but was very, um, really, uh, very not expensive. And, and uh, it was uh, relatively in a nascent stage where some of the use cases that we required was not met by the application. Then uh, New Relic uh, is something that is common across the community and it's popular as well, but it is expensive and we have a huge amount of data that's going in there, which we need to pay for. And it is a completely managed solution. But again, the cost perspective is something which we need to consider whether we should go for or not. Now, then comes Loki, which is again scalable, open source, widely accepted in the community and has NHA and uh, native integration of Grafana apps. Whatever, uh, whatever application that Grafana labs have developed is easily can be integrated with Loki and not much expensive compared to ELK and uh, New Relic. Considering all these factors, we decided we'll go ahead with Loki. Since it is scalable, we can have alerts and dashboarding for our insights, cost effective, completely managed in our infrastructure itself and uh, popular among the uh, whole community and we were used to prometheus and prometheus grafana and we have metrics there then why can't we have the logs also in same grafana which will make it easy for us to handle both together so these these points helped us to in, uh, finalize that loki is something that we need to go for at this point, I will uh, take a pause and I would like to invite uh, Pramod Ayapan from Facets uh, Cloud to explain about Loki architecture. And uh, welcome, Pramod. Hey, thanks, Rajit. Yeah, I'm sharing my screen. Yeah, so hope you can see my screen. So hi everyone, uh, this is Pramod. Um, so I am part of uh, Facers for more than a year now as a technical lead. And today I'll be going over uh, the overview of uh, Grafana Loki, right? So what is uh, Loki? Uh, Loki is horizontally scalable, highly available, and then multi-tenant log aggregation system that is inspired by Prometheus. So all these buzzwords here you are seeing, right? This is what uh, makes Loki stand out from uh, other logging solutions. And it is developed by Grafana Labs. So as you can see, it is having really, really lot of popularity and widely accepted by the community. And like Prometheus, uh, uh, it is for logs. Uh, in Prometheus, we have metrics, but this is entirely for logs. And it is very cost effective. Uh, it is open source and it is still actively maintained. Uh, next is minimal index logging. So unlike other logging solutions, Loki actually does not uh, index the entire log content. Instead, what it does is uh, the, only the entries are grouped into streams and it will index only the labels. And that too, the labels are Prometheus style labels. Uh, I will talk about this Prometheus style, style labels in the next slide. And here there is a small uh, diagrammatic representation where you can see log data is about uh, 10 TB and only 200 MB of index data is there, right? So what uh, this will improve the performance as well as querying time will be really faster because only 200, of, 200 MB of data we need to query, right? And this is not the exact uh, uh, like exact representation. Like if this will change environment to environment as well as configuration co to configuration. It is all based on the logs that you are pushing into the system. So that that you need to consider. And then next is indexing logs. So here uh, you can see how the label, how it is indexing and then uh, what is not indexed here. So only the timestamp and then the Prometheus style labels are getting indexed. And here why uh, Prometheus style labels is because we are here in Loki, it is exactly using same as Prometheus, right? That is why it is called uh, uh, Prometheus style labels and only the uh, contents is not indexed here. And uh, worth noting here is, when you use uh, fewer labels, you will get a better performance out of Loki. And then um, uh, we'll ta I'll be talking about uh, log stream, what is log stream as well as high cardinality problem. So what is log stream, right? So log stream is a stream of entries with same exact label set. So here we have three different lines, but uh, if you see, if you look at the labels here, they are all same labels, right? 
so what uh, what happens is that this is considered as a single stream and similarly in the other two lines you will have a same uh, set of labels so this is also considered as single stream so totally we have uh, three uh, totally we have two streams here and now if we talk about cardinality problem let me introduce one more, one, one more label called node right uh, for let's take the first stream so we have three different lines and in that we are going to add a new label called node and each will have a node 1 node 2 and node 3 now what happens is that uh, this will become uh, so first uh, uh, first line will become a stream and then the next line will become its own stream and then third will become a different stream so if this is happening in a logic system let's say if we introduce a, a label called ip and whenever there is a user there are multiple users who it this url right and those will also get uh, processed right so that's what high cardinality problem will like that that will lead to high cardinality problem when there are uh, multiple unique streams then that will be the problem for high cardinality there is uh, an example here as you can see from a log line we have levels log levels and then statuses and then we also have paths right for each log level we will have uh, each different statuses as a, uh, from that same log line and then we will have for each status we will have uh, three different parts so uh, ultimately if you uh, like if you do a quick math here like 4 uh, into 3 into 3 that will be lead to in, leading to uh, potentially 36 streams here right so that is what causing the high cardinality problem so we have actually uh, uh, handled this in our pro uh, product like removing high cardinality labels and then uh, we are packing it into uh, that i will talk in the different slide but yeah and then next is uh, deployment modes so we have three uh, deployment modes here monolithic mode simple scalable and then microservices mode so what mono monolithic mode is uh, basically as you can see all the low key components are packed into a single process as a single binary right and uh, this is only useful when for getting started and to do some exp experimentation on the low key side and uh, this monolithic, monolithic mode only supports uh, average of 20 GB per day of logs and which is not really adequate for production grade systems, right? And uh, in simple scalable, all, uh, as you can see, each execution path is uh, like splitted into uh, each, three target groups, basically write, read, and then backend. And each have its own uh, uh, use cases, like you can um, uh, like scale each, uh, like targets uh, individually and you can increase the performance and here it will support few hundred uh, few tbs of logs and however if you go beyond that few tbs right then only approaches microservices mode here as you can see all the components in the loki are uh, run separately and you can do customization and you have the flexibility to configure each component separately and based on the load you can increase one of the component or the other so that are the advantages of microservices mode. Now, uh, how it works, right? So unlike Prometheus, uh, Loki doesn't do a pull. Instead, it only pushes, right? So uh, for that, we need to use an agent that should uh, collect logs from node and then uh, which will be sent to the Loki. So that is what, uh, so that's, what, that's how Loki works. Here, in this case, we are using prompt tail and uh, prompt tail uses uh, a same uh, a library as Prometheus for service discovery as well as uh, uh, Prometheus styling uh, style labels. So those are all created by Promptail itself and it is a product from Grafana Labs again. Um, so this will push the logs to Loki and to visualize the logs you can uh, use Grafana uh, where you can uh, visualize through uh, LogQL queries or also you can use a command line tool called LogCLI. Uh, again there also you can use a LogQL query and then uh, with log with loki you can also set up alerts uh, using alert manager and uh, also you can do recording rules so uh, it's all possible from loki set and here is a sample um, a query a log ql query as you can see here uh, i have filtered with query fronted container and then namespace loki dev and i'm gripping for error log right so what it does is it will return with uh, all the error logs from this container so next is the architecture. So here we have write path and then the read path. 
right in the right path we have distributor ingester and in the read path we have uh, query front end courier and then the ruler right so whenever log uh, enters into loki first uh, distributor will be the one that will receive the log and it will do some uh, validation checks as well as it will the, this is the service that is responsible to determine which ingester that log needs to be pushed to and once it reaches ingester ingester will be uh, sending the logs to long term storage like object store like uh, s3 uh, gcp blob or whatever the cloud provided uh, storage right and then uh, once uh, ingester comes here a courier will be responsible for uh, handling all the queries from the api or uh, from the grafana right and first courier will hit the ingester uh, and it will look for in memory data first if uh, the timeline doesn't su suffice then what it will do is it will fall back to the object store and it will get the data and here query front end uh, is just an optimization of courier where uh, uh, what it will do is it will split large number a large um, uh, very big query into smaller chunks and then it will concurrently execute them and then stitches back the result and uh, uh, give it to the customer the user whoever uh, using the grafana or the api calls and then here uh, on the left hand side you can see we have a ruler so ruler is the component that is responsible for uh, creating a rule alerts and as well as uh, recording rules so whenever we create a rule uh, that we there we can specify which uh, target like in alert manager if we want to get we can uh, target that so that are all taken care by ruler so this is about the architecture uh, now we will talk about the hashing uh, so basically uh, uh, a distributor is the primary service that is responsible for uh, uh, determining the ingester right so how it determines is that it uses consistent hashing plus configurable uh, replication factor right and uh, uh, the stream is hashed into hashed using both uh, tenant id as well as label set and also uh, uh, loki maintains a ring for each uh, service and uh, here in this case like ingester register themselves into hash ring with a set of tokens let me quickly show an example of this so here uh, in this diagram you can see a circle here right that is called a ring and uh, each ingester uh, on the right hand side will register uh, with a couple of, like with with set of tokens that is 0 to 16348 uh, 16384 right so that uh, that range will be registered by the ingester and that goes on till ingester 4 so whenever a logs comes in uh, from prom uh, prompt tail to distributor what happens is that uh, distributor does some uh, hashing so uh, at the bottom you can see right uh, first uh, log comes in and it will hash the label and it will get the hash number and based on that hash uh, it will select the ingester within the range so it will go clockwise so if you see it will uh, the number uh, corresponds to the range uh, that is in the ingester 2 and similarly uh, the other other all others as you can see from the image with uh, uh, colors it has uh, like placed into two uh, three different ingesters and uh, let's say if we have a replication factor uh, uh, larger than one uh, currently this is for replication one right uh, what if it is two replication two right in that case what happens is that uh, uh, first it will place the first line into ingester two and then it will in the clockwise it will select the next subsequent uh, ingester in this case ingester three so two copies of uh, first stream will be stored in uh, ingester 2 and ingester 3. So this is how the hashing works. Um, yeah. And then uh, next uh, we'll move on to integrate, uh, yeah, integration of Loki into Faces platform. So with these learnings as well as uh, from Capillary's insights, uh, we are able to integrate uh, Loki into Faces uh, with the right production grade configuration. And what we did actually is uh, we have done uh, load testing using Loki Canary. Um, and also we have uh, uh, tested with uh, actual data from various deployed applications. And with, uh, uh, with, uh, from within facets, we are able to, we support uh, storage backend, uh, including uh, credential handling. Uh, Loki needs to have a credential, right? So uh, for uh, like storage backend that is in the cloud so that is automatically handled and also we provide kates native minayo storage solution as well and then along with this we also automatically create a loki data source and integrate into grafana and also we deploy quick log search for easily accessing logs from uh, filters 
and then um, we have also dropped high cardinality label so to make uh, loki very eff efficient and performant and then uh, what we did is uh, we actually uh, uh, like packed all these drop lab labels uh, into the log line itself so that at the query time what we do is after the, uh, the cell comes in we perform uh, the transformation and get the filters within the grafana itself so that's how we are doing internally and then uh, there is one other option called um, auto forget unhealthy instances that we have enabled because uh, uh, whenever there is a ingester that gets down abruptly without any doing any cleanup activity uh, right at that time what happens is that uh, it will still be in the ring so it is not it will be uh, with the state unhealthy so uh, because of that loki won't accept any more logs uh, that needs to be ma manually removed from the ring so we have to access the api and we have to remove it from the ring so that's why we gone with this approach and we have added uh, auto forget unhealthy and uh, it will automatically remove all the unhealthy instances and then there are few more optimizations um, like 2 and 4 from uh, capillary inside and we have made all those optimizations and now uh, we have very good uh, loki integration in phases platform and here you can see on the right hand side uh, it is an example from phases uh, resource so we have deployed on application and as you can see from that application we are able to get the logs and uh, from this tab we will be able to list all the logs for that particular resource yeah, so that's it from me, and I'll be uh, giving it to uh, Srijit. But Srijit, you can take over. Thank you. Thank Pramod uh, for a detailed uh, uh, insights on the overview of uh, Loki. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so uh, the audience, I have an update here. Uh, you can uh, post your questions in the chat box provided. Uh, we'll be taking those questions at the end of the session and we will provide the answer. Thank you. And uh, yeah, where were we? We, we have uh, selected Loki to be implemented in uh, our uh, capillary clusters. So we had to decide how to implement this, uh, how to, uh, deployment strategy needs to be uh, defined uh, to take it forward. So we came up with this plan where first we will have it deployed in non-production clusters. Then once it is stabilized and signed off, we will move it to the production clusters and then uh, see the stability and other things and then roll out to the rest of the environment. Now slowly after that, we will uh, phase out the legacy setup. Now this is the event line that we had uh, while uh, deploying the Loki in the non-production clusters. So as facets to uh, cloud has in integrated Loki in its module, um, for us, it was just a matter of changing the configuration in the blueprint and uh, deploying uh, Loki in our clusters. So uh, the release or the installation was seamless. Later, we conducted load tests uh, for Loki uh, in our uh, non-production infrastructure with whatever limit it had and uh, to understand the behavior and scaling patterns of Loki. Now, um, on, along with the load test, we wanted to, uh, identify, to identify the behavior of Loki. We need to see how, um, how the other matrices behave along with uh, the variation in load. So we defined some uh, matrices which Loki already provides into Prometheus, like log drop, uh, resource usages, scaling patterns, chunk size, push to S3 bucket, etc were created and alerts were created on top of it to see how the behavior or how uh, the log pattern variation happens and how Loki behaves. Now, when it comes in to the developer perspective, um, we were completely planning to uh, remove the old legacy setup and bring in a new, uh, completely new, uh, uh, what do you call it, completely new setup of a, a Loki uh, logging strategy. Now, this transition we wanted to have it seamless for the developers to handle and towards to the newer technology adoption so on that basis what we uh, tried is to create uh, documents for references create um, kt and workshops for uh, how loki works and all then um, asked for the feedback of the developers we asked them to create jira tickets to let us know how loki is behaving how what sort of issues they are facing 
which gave us the idea how uh, effective Loki is, how it is improving the efficiency of developers' day-to-day -day work. Slowly, once we decided the uh, timeline of removing uh, the legacy setup in non-prod cluster after getting a sign-off, we slowly removed the whole, uh, uninstalled the whole old setup and completely we were running on Loki in non-production clusters. Then later on, uh, we decided to go for the production uh, release. We wanted to do a capacity planning. And this capacity planning was something which we uh, decided depending on the log volume, the log, uh, the load test that we conducted. And later on, that linear projection that we created, we came up with a configuration which we decided will go ahead into uh, the uh, production cluster. Now, um, as I said, we have uh, clusters across the globe. Uh, some are generating heavy uh, amount of logs, some are not generating that much. But there are clusters sitting in the middle uh, having a medium amount of log. So considering that scenario, we thought of going ahead with the medium amount of log, which would give us a balance between the two and see how effective is Loki in those kind of clusters. Thus, uh, deciding the cluster once we started, uh, uh, we planned for a release and uh, we went ahead with the release of the Loki in that cluster. <clears throat> and parallelly, uh, we wanted uh, the legacy setup also running in the same uh, infrastructure, considering we may need some time to um, stabilize Loki in our production cluster. Now, the, this is the time for monitoring. Yes, um, as soon as we deployed Loki into the uh, production cluster, we came across uh, different roadblocks. On a, uh, on a categorizing scale, we uh, categorized those um, issues into four points, and they are like rate limits, where the ingestion rate that we calculated and in real time was way different. Uh, ingester issues where the ingester pods went into home kill and restart issues were there. S3 rate limit where from S3, uh, from ingester to um, S3 push of chunks, we're having throttling issues. And at the end, querying problem where we started getting timeouts whenever we run a query and uh, that was another kind of a problem in the rate path. Now let's go into each and every, I'll surf through each and every issues uh, and just to understand how uh, uh, how each and uh, each problems were handled differently. Now, rate limiting, as I said, the ingestion rate uh, from uh, prompt tail to uh, distributor to ingester, that is something which uh, was completely um, identified in the uh, non-production clusters. Now, when it comes to the production cluster, what we could see is that the configured value was never enough and distributors started throwing error that there are too many uh, log volume happening, we need to control it. Now, sooner we identified this error and we started increasing the size. Now, looking, having a closer look at the uh, ingester rate, uh, Loki is designed for a multi-tenant environment where you can send logs from different clusters to a single Loki infrastructure. In such a scenario, the ingestion rate of one tenant shouldn't affect the log collection of other tenants in, and bring down the Loki environment for other plus other um, and other tenants also because there is one Loki environment to which all the tenants are sending. In that scenario, the ingestion rate is something that is needed to keep the volume in in a constant or optimal rate. But what about uh, in capillary? We have one Loki cluster in uh, per production cluster in production uh, three, uh, infra, and um, uh, in our case, we don't have a multi tenant environment. In this case, we have only a single tenant whose uh, uh, rate can be adjusted, but it's not like you can give the range more than uh, beyond a limit so that the ingester will get loaded and have to manage a lot of logs and you keep on adding more resources to it. So it is always good to have a sweet spot to have uh, keep the logs in limit, but uh, making the other components not overloaded. So we gave a uh, safe upper bound and uh, in, co in combination with the ingester rate limit as well as the ingester burst limit, we have around 100 Mbps in majority of the clusters. 
now in large scale most of the clusters have similar limit that we have configured but actual rate is much lesser than that keeping the water, keeping uh, the ingestion rate in control so that uh, um, ingesters won't get loaded and they can easily handle which in effect will help us to send um, the chunks properly to s3 bucket yes we had uh, we received a lot of out of memory issues after increasing the ingestion rate now a lot of uh, uh, streams were getting created uh, in each and every ingester on investigating more what we could see is uh, the node number number of nodes in production and number of nodes in non production clusters were different we have more numbers in production cluster obviously now the node level is one of the label that we are sending to loki and that is being indexed automatically the stream numbers also increased because of the same so we uh, decided to bring down node label after considering that in our usual or day to day troubleshooting uh, process here process we don't see that node label is much you know, of an importance so in that scenario what we decided we will drop the node label directly from prompt tail itself which in effect helped us to reduce the number of streams and reduce the memory usage of each and every ingester but again uh, out of a surprise uh, we got out of memory again for ingester and in uh, in this scenario we didn't have all the ingesters going into omkill we had one or two among them going into omkill and this specifically is because the streams are allocated per ingester in that scenario the um, streams the streams since the streams are going to a single ingesters the uh, application which is generating that stream if it is having higher volume and at some point if it is generating as um, sudden burst of uh, log volumes then automatically the memory usage of that ingester will go high and it goes to omkill in such a scenario we wanted something to handle or control the size of streams and that's where loki is providing an automatic sharding uh, option which we enable and we gave a limit of around 3 mb per uh, per stream so that anything above 3 mb will get sharded and a sharding key will be added to that specific stream which in effect distributed these streams among different ingesters rather than one ingester and after that what we could see that all of these ingesters were starting to use similar amount of memory consistently now out of disk issues uh, this is something that we noticed in different instances where um, the ingesters get into a restart and the valve replay kicks in and uh, once valve replay starts the disk ingester disk starts piling up with valve file and uh, i reported this issue in the um, loki community but i haven't got an update on the same till now um, so uh, it doesn't have a pattern it will get, get cleared off after some time it uh, doesn't have a fixed size or it doesn't have fixed number or a time at which it will get cleared so that was bit uh, causing a problem so what as a workaround what i had to do was to increase the disk size a little bit over portion disk and keep an alerting on those disks so once such an issue happens we'll get an alert and we will be in a position to decide whether we should expand the disk online so that is the only workaround that that i could implement now after completely releasing everything in our production cluster still now i haven't faced this issue and uh, this was something that we noticed during our uh, testing and stabilizing phase unhealthy ingesters yes uh, as pramod said auto forget is something that was not by default enabled which in effect uh, when a ingester restarts or it was not completely uh, it was an incomplete restart or a node goes into hang state and ingester has got a heartbeat request which if it doesn't reply to that it is considered unhealthy automatically the ring will get considered unhealthy and uh, distributor will not be able to commit the logs in it so automate to remove these unhealthy ingesters an auto forget flag was enabled so as to handle that scenario now s3 rate limits so ingesters push the chunks log chunks into s3 bucket now uh, the since the number of api calls started increasing when the more log volume increases 
S3 started throttling all our requests and it started throwing error as well. In this scenario, we had to limit the number of API calls that is going to S3 bucket. So where we had to adjust the chunk size, uh, max chunk age, etc., to minimize the API calls. And then comes the querying issue. So all these issues that I had discussed now, till now, is re regarding the write path of Loki. Now, when it comes to the read path, where the querier comes in, we have a lot of components that are there in front of courier. We have courier front end, we have uh, uh, Loki gateway, we have an uh, Grafana, we have uh, Nginx in, uh, ingress, etc., which through which the query is passed. By the time courier respond back with the uh, query result, we used to get a get a timeout. And some of these gateways had very like 30 seconds or 60 seconds uh, gateway timeout set, which in effect to solve, we had to go for uh, go go into each and every component and then re reconfigure the gateway and proxy timeouts. Thus, uh, after as I said, we were we had launched this uh, Loki in a medium cluster, and we came across a bunch of issues and learning uh, learnings were there from these issues. So, collating all of them, we reconfigured our blueprint of Loki according to uh, the issues and how it was solved. Then, and making the same into the facets cloud blueprint, we were confident enough that this, after releasing uh, this configuration in another cluster, we won't be facing the same issues. With that confidence, we decided to go ahead with other clusters as well. And uh, to say maximum, we had to uh, reconfigure some of the CPU and memory uh, configuration other than that these same issues we couldn't find in other clusters and they are running fine now uh, once it was stabilized across clusters and our devs started using loki across the production clusters we slowly started thinking of uh, removing that legacy setup now uh, immediately what we did is we made the logs unavailable in Betty and but still QND was pushing the logs to EFS as well as S3 bucket and slowly once we were completely confirmed and uh, confident and uh, it was in a green zone we decided to uh, phase out the whole legacy system and thus Loki was uh, successfully rolled out in our production clusters. Now, what is the business uh, impact we could leverage from the logs? Now, logs are available in Grafana. Uh, the querying, uh, the prompt QL query, sorry, the log QL query uh, pattern can be used or the method can be used to query all the logs uh, from uh, Loki. Now, the business metrics that we can generate from the bunch of logs, like how many requests are coming in, uh, what are the API calls, what are the um, uh, uh, latencies that we are having, etc we started recording using the Loki recording rules and uh, they were pre-computed and sent to Prometheus. And th that's where we look into the metrics that are generated from the log lines. Now, uh, alerts also could be, be configured uh, for Loki as well as other applications. And even we were monitoring Loki's performance using Loki uh, alerting rules and um, uh, different applications uh, which are throwing exceptions errors etc were alerted using the alerting rules of Loki. Now uh, if you look back uh, if I look back and uh, understand how the whole journey was um, Loki is an excellent product and uh, it does its job very well but not like uh, with the whole default setup uh, you won't be able to implement it. Uh, you have to make your adjustments as per the uh, line, as per the volume or, or as per the cluster that you are running in. Yes, there are tons and tons of configurations in Loki that needs to be handled and understood, which requires an engineering investment. And extensive domain knowledge is something which required because there are a lot of components that are running uh, across the uh, board, which needs to be handled and understood. With that, uh, we'll uh, conclude the session here. And uh, thanks, uh, thank you again for everyone to join. And uh, we, I would be happy to take the questions. Uh, thank yeah. you. Yes, yeah, so, so I'll probably quickly uh, send over the questions to you. So maybe first we'll address the questions that uh, that, that uh, you have to answer, Srijit.
Um, so Ashutosh, your question uh, is more directed at Pramod. We'll take that at the end. Uh, Vishnu, so uh, Vishnu Raj has asked, what are the read, read latencies that you are seeing, uh, Srijit? Read latencies. So I think P95, I just looked up, I think in uh, in your largest cluster, I do see a few hundred seconds there. Sounds okay. about right. Okay, I don't remember the exact numbers, Vishnu, but <laughs> could be. Yeah, so Vishnu, uh, there I do see um, uh, like P95 to be like a few hundred seconds. Uh, so did you do anything to address the latency itself? Did you try any optimization to reduce the querying latency, Srijit? Or are you living with it? Yeah. No, no, no. We had uh, changed the compression ratio. Compression where it was snappy, we changed it to GSIP. And um, we had uh, even changed the chunk size and query uh, timeouts, as well as the courier size and scaling. Etc. to handle the uh, querying performance. Okay, but uh, in in general, yeah. So from my point of view, uh, Vishnu. So uh, for a for a specific time window, when when you are within a localized time window, it, the query performance is not an issue. But when you are looking for like events over a day or things like that, that's when Loki starts acting up and you, you probably need to live with some amount of log, log latency because of course there is this uh, turn down time with S3 and things like that. Um, yeah, but I don't think, the, uh, so so on, and also as Srijit mentioned initially, like uh, there are only a few hundred queries happening. So more important was to collect all the data and be able to create recording rules and uh, you know, create dashboards so that people do not need to do, uh, you know, large analytics type queries because that are getting converted into metrics in Prometheus and uh, address from there. Um, yeah, so I think Vishnu had a couple of more questions. Uh, what is the caching system used in the system? If possible, share the specifications of, of the cache size. Uh, Srijit? Uh, um, yeah, I think caching system, I think memcache is there. Uh, sizing, I don't uh, have it with me, but it's there. Okay, what is the quick log search in Grafana? Yeah, Vishnu, so that is a uh, custom dashboard that we ended up creating so that uh, people need not write the common log quills, at least searching by an application, searching by a time range, and searching searching for certain patterns within the selected applications. So for those, uh, we created a custom dashboard in Grafana, so so it's, it's just the name of the dashboard. Uh, it's not something that is packaged with Grafana. And coming to, yeah, what is a uh, daily compressed log volume in capillary that is running with? I think over a TB, right? That is a compressed in S3 per day. That the day-to-day day -to -day increment in S3 uh, is is around a TB. Uh, that's that's in on an average. Right. Uh, yeah, and Vishnu, yeah, so S3 throttling uh, uh, was removed by increasing the chunk size. Yeah, so that I think is right. So basically, idea is to reduce the number of API calls. Um, recording rules can create metrics from logs and send to Prometheus. Yeah, so this is something. Yeah, so can you explain this? So how do you configure a recording rule is what Vishnu is asking. So basically, by specific patterns, you can uh, uh, extract out metrics and and send it to Prometheus, right? Uh, Srijit, maybe you can elaborate. Yeah, so basically, uh, Vishnu, it's, uh, you, are trying, you are just configuring the same log QL query in the recording rules. So the uh, ruler is something that this is used for. In the ruler's config map, you can mention the, your rules. Uh, rules is basically the um, uh, log QL uh, query that you want to generate metrics on which you will be running your aggregation like sum, count, etc which will generate the metrics uh, metrics with labels. And then in the ruler config, you can mention which Prometheus uh, you need to send this data to and the uh, rest ruler will take care of it. Yeah, so maybe we, uh, if we can find out the documentation and put in the link, maybe uh, promote if we can do that, that will be helpful. Um, yeah, so I, and Vishnu has asked, what are the concurrent users that are actively using uh, Loki, and also about what is the chunk size that you are uh, you have configured uh, so that you can work around that API rate limit? Do you know the exact numbers, Srijit? Numbers, I haven't. Uh, I don't have those numbers with me as of now. Okay. Uh, 
maybe yeah we'll, we we can get back uh, so vishnu so i think we'll at the end plug in our slack channel so maybe we can uh, you know connect there and uh, discuss a bit sure. more yeah, uh, those questions i can maybe answer in the slack channel where i can get the correct numbers and share with you yeah so now let me go back uh, so shresh jain has asked uh, yeah i was going through the loki and its analysis done by different people one of the issues with loki is that since it does not index all text but rather performs a distributed grep so the searching time is a bit long so do you have information on the best ways to deal with it and how well you are able to improve on it so basically the uh, i think the querier site is something that we need to tune for and uh, the number of uh, so uh, the as per the time window um, courier will start downloading the logs uh, downloading the chunks from s3 bucket and then load that into the memory and that that's where this grep and the searching mechanism happens so most probably what you need to try to look at is how effective the chunk size is how uh, how large is your courier uh, size memory size as well and how the scaling of courier you can uh, make it fast those things i would uh, i think that should help more in the uh, making querying uh, faster i think there is auto scaling set there right so is it uh, right. it, it is having hpa yes we have uh, query hpa yeah and yeah so uh, jyoti ratna giri has asked regarding the auto forget healthy member uh, when running ingestors as stateful sets this flag helps in removing bad ingestor from the ring but the pvc okay he's continued it in another yeah uh, attach seems to have corrupted val when the node terminates abruptly and the new ingester attach it, attaches itself to the pvc could not read the corrupted val files as a result of a failure is this some is this something that you have experienced is corrupted val is not something that you have experienced right uh, corrupted val is not something i have experienced in my uh, in my testing uh, until until now so the val exposure is something which i have faced uh, let me see if something comes uh, comes around yeah so uh, what we ex experience is that the val files which should be cleaned up periodically uh, does not happen in in case of such unclean term, uh, uh, unclean terminations and uh, when it comes back up we have seen this pattern that it tends to uh, you know explode all of a sudden and fill up the uh, disk and which is what srijit mentioned that he had to over provision the disk for the time being and he raised an issue with uh, uh, with loki community for that um yeah so yeah, how did you achieve no log drops uh, did you use any queuing service i guess it, there's no queuing service as is it's mostly by tuning uh the distributor and just making sure that they are always available to accept the request from uh, prompt tail and also uh, and also you have write ahead log so that nothing gets i mean so ingester does not you you are not relying on ingester availability uh, throughout uh, yeah so and anything else to add this is it like um you can tune the prompt tail um, retrial mechanism which you can reconfigure how much time it should keep uh, trying and those things also can be tuned so that um, uh, and along with that uh, there's a max uh, chunk age that uh, max age i think it's max age i think uh, suppose ingester is down for last 15 minutes and any log beyond 15 minutes it might not accept if that configuration is there so those things you can increase considering uh, there are no log drops or else uh, once ingester comes up the dip and the log uh, log the time stamp of the log is very old automatically uh, it just will um, uh, prompt tail will have to uh, drop those logs uh, because uh, distributor will not accept the log uh, due to the setting yeah and and uh, i think uh, it also to monitor this was an important so uh, important mm -hmm. aspect so we did have uh, so prompt tail of course gives a metric prompt on has a drop uh, metrics yes and also there is this uh, loki canary test uh, testing that you can do where uh, there's a small application that will generate a log and then make sure that the log is searchable through loki after a certain period right uh, so this is something that we actively make sure is there in all systems that is one of the big uh, i mean red flags if that is not working and then of course you have component level alerts which will help you isolate where the issue lies so over a period of a few weeks i think we could uh, you know optimize on 
uh, all the scaling parameters and uh, let's say chunk sizes, queue sizes, all of those parameters, right? Yeah. Uh, can Loki handle mon a monolith application that generate a few dBs of unstructured log, unstructured log, not, not JSON logs, uh, where we do not have an intelligent way of creating labels? Uh, yeah, Umesh, so this is technically possible. So you can do it two ways. One is uh, at a prompt tail level, you could go ahead and uh, configure some sort of a log. I mean, you can config configure a log pattern and extract labels from it. This will be a little bit more CPU intensive at the collection end. Or like one of the ways that I would suggest is like uh, do not index anything in the labels. Make sure that you are, when, when you're searching, you are searching a reasonable uh, time window. And what you can do is, uh, Loki log QL itself has a support where you can specify the log pattern and it can extract out fields. So you don't really need index labels for this. Uh, you can you can extract out the fields and you can even filter by them. So what happens is that the es essentially the log lines that are being queried from the index and filtered as based on the time 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 window. And then what you do is you you use this uh, log QLs pattern option to uh, go and extract out the fields and then filter by it. So that would happen at the query in memory in the query and uh, not it will not have to hit uh, S3. So that's a more reasonable balancing act that uh, you can probably take up unless you, of course, need to dashboard based on a label or something like that. Uh, yeah, I think I have gone through most questions uh, okay does it support gcs uh, also apart from s3 for storage yeah yes uh, and so it, it supports uh, uh, gcs as well um and umesh just one more question how many nodes have you deployed to handle 1.5 tb of logs every day yeah so that's an interest so how, how much like can you give a ballpark rigid of how much for you're spending for ingester and over the whole setup maybe i think i am running around seven to eight nodes Average. Uh, what, what configuration? Like uh, um, uh, eight CPU, thirty-two GB RAM. Eight core, thirty-two, and around seven to eight uh, nodes. What are you saying? And uh, do you retain the log somewhere in the local storage before you flush it out? Yeah. So, uh, how how much do you retain in the ingester? How many days? Uh, Twenty-four hours, is it? No, no, no. Uh, I think uh, like maybe two hours or less. Thirty minutes or less. That's all. Oh, thirty minutes. Sorry. Because max yeah. max yeah. Yeah. Just, it's keep on pushing to S three bucket. Yeah, so th th 30 minutes stays in uh, in ingester oh, and everything uh, either, else. Either, either 30 minutes or the size that I have given. Uh, like which one is first, it will push to S3. Got it. Uh, if we are not storing the logs locally, then how does a 24 hour query behave since it has to fetch everything from the uh, object store? Uh, yeah. So yeah, so this is something that you have to. Uh, uh, I mean, so it you, it does to search. Actually, you don't need to fetch all the data. You only need to fetch the indexes back from the uh, uh, from S3. So that is usually a smaller file to fetch, and then you get uh, the exact log lines to fetch. But yeah, for a query range of twenty four hours, uh, definitely you are looking at like probably a few seconds of wait time to get the uh, results back. It's not going to be instant, uh, Umesh, with Loki at least. Um, do we need compute in instance in intensive instance for deploying our Loki instead of uh, memory optimized? Uh, so um, no, we don't. I am. We are not running on a compute intensive uh, instance. We are using M type uh, instances everywhere. General uh, purpose. General purpose, and I don't see the CPU usage of Loki is not that intensive. I haven't seen that going uh, more than two CPUs. But uh, memory is something that is more uh, of uh, demand here. Yeah. And uh, he has also asked what components in which ingester or query, which one needs to be more memory intensive uh, and which instances need to be computed. Then ingesters and queries are both memory intensive, considering the number of queries and the number of volume that they are handling. Yeah. Cool. So I think uh, we have covered most questions now. I think there is one question from Ashutosh. He wanted a little bit more clarity on the uh, consistent hashing ring. So Pramod, if you can share the ring ring uh, slide, maybe I can take a dig at it. Meanwhile, keep the questions coming, guys. Uh, uh, you can see my screen, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so 
Ashutosh, so maybe I'll try to explain this. So this is a general principle. This is not just a low-key thing. Uh, it's something that you would see across distributed data stores, where uh, if you have multiple instances that uh, where the data is spread across, uh, the strategy of how where which data goes to which instance is determined by this uh, method called consistent hashing. Right. So what you do is you you take a range, uh, an integer range, let's say, and put it on the circle like this. So for in this particular case, so it is zero to whatever is that uh, uh, the max of uh, unsigned int, I think, and uh, whatever and you place the ingesters equidistant uh, amongst them. So you say uh, zero to uh, x would be handled by ingester one, x to y by the other one, and y to z by the other one, that sort of a thing. And this data is being stored in console in the case of Loki, I think. And what happens is this distributor who gets the log line uh, determines the stream, and based on the stream and the tenant, it would uh, like uh, it, it would uh, compute a, a hash. So hash function spits out a number in this particular range, and then it will figure out which range the uh, number belongs to, and uh, selects the ingester that is adjacent to it. So that's how you assign the uh, ingester to streams. And if you have a replication factor uh, of more than one, uh, you assign it to one more neighbor uh, of that ingester. So the idea is that even if one ingester goes, uh, goes away, uh, you have a simple strategy on who needs to uh, take care of what data. And you have uh, people with redundancy. So if a data needs to be copied over from one instance to the other, uh, the data is still available uh, in the uh, neighboring instance. So uh, that that's about the hashing wing. So which is where uh, the interesting thing happened for uh, Srijit, right? So he had the app label low. So app, app label, I think in touch API, started generating a lot of logs and everything was going to a particular in ingester. And that caused it to go out of memory. But once he enabled sharding, automated sharding, so the number of streams got split out. And so now it is more evenly distributed across all the uh, all the uh, ingester instances. Uh, so yeah, so I think this uh, hashing ring concept is something that, that everyone needs to be aware of uh, while using Loki, because uh, you can narrow down many issues uh, by understanding the architecture of this one. Um, Ashutosh, if that is clear, um, if you have any specific questions on that, let me know. OK, also, Adi has linked our uh, Slack community uh, uh, link in the chat. Uh, so if if you want, like I think uh, people who needed exact numbers and sizing and, uh, and things like that, we can uh, connect over Slack and discuss. Uh, and of course, there will be more issues that will be coming up in Loki and, and whatnot. Uh, so it will be a good place to share the knowledge and our experiences as well. Uh, there's also an AI bot that answers some questions about facets. So uh, so those who use facets do try it out uh, if, if it is able to give you uh, good responses. Yeah. So I think we can wind up the session. Uh, thanks, everyone, for uh, joining. Uh, and also see you around in the community and we'll have more of these sessions thanks everyone yeah, thanks everyone. Thank you.